marked. This is in chapter number three of the book of James. Uh, does anybody need any? I asked a few minutes ago. Does anybody need a copy of the questions? Brenda needs them. I'm sorry. Reed. All right. Question number three, and of course we're we're developing the thoughts here relative to a priority that has to be placed upon teachers. Don't be many masters. And the word, of course, is the idea of teaching. And, of course, as we use these other passages that reinforce the concept that obviously we've got to have teachers, and so we know for a fact that James is not saying, don't anybody teach, because that can't be the case, as we are of necessity supposed to be developing to the best of our ability to be teachers. And we looked at that in Hebrews chapter 5 at, at the end of that chapter when due to the amount of time that they had been members of the church, those that were addressed by the Hebrew writer, then they should have been in a position where they could have been very stable, uh, mature teachers. But they were not for some reason. Uh, in other words, the, the writer says, there's a whole lot of things I'd like to say about the priesthood of Melchizedek, and, but I just can't do it because you're dull of hearing. It wouldn't do any good. You wouldn't be able to comprehend it. And so he was limited in what he could say to them because they had not matured spiritually as they should. They were still on a milk diet. They were still running around in their spiritual pampers. They were sucking on a spiritual pacifier. They were not growing as they should, and they were rep reprimanded for that. Well, of course, that means then, even though he has warned about teachers receiving a greater condemnation, we know that there's got to be teachers. Teachers that are capable of communicating God's will. But here's a possible another part of the problem here from 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Read with me, if you will. I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And then in addition to that, in Romans chapter 2, verse 21, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? So from these two passages then, the clarification could be added further as to what restrictions then would be placed then upon the teacher considering these two passages of Scripture. Don't teach if you're not going to teach the truth. Uh, if you don't know what you're talking about, then it's going to be pretty obvious to some people. And even if it's not obvious to some people, if you don't know what you're talking about, you don't need to be talking. The best thing for a person to do when they don't know is say, I don't know, and not act like they know. And if someone's there, here's what will happen. If somebody's there and they actually do know, and they see you flying by the seat of your britches and acting like you know, they're not going to have any confidence in you from then on. And rightfully so. Because here's a person that's claiming to have the ability to explain something that they are clueless about entirely. And I don't mean that we have to know everything about everything before we can say anything about it for sure, or else nobody could ever be a teacher. But there is a responsibility of having a firm grasp of that which you're trying to teach. That's why it's probably not ever going to happen that somebody's going to ask me to help them with English, you know. That they would say, well, you obviously can't help me in that subject, but believe it or not, I do know quite a bit about English. I just don't speak it, you know. I write it most of the time, but you've got to know something about what you're trying to impart unto others. And then, of course, and that warning there is to the elders uh, at the church in church at Ephesus, as, as Paul is clearly telling Timothy here are individuals that need to have their mouths stopped. Here are people who are teaching things they ought not teach. They're causing problems by the things that they're saying. And so those are the type of teachers nobody needs are those that are raising an issue about something that doesn't amount to hill of beans anyhow just so they can have an argument. 
And, of course, we know that that can take over a whole classroom period sometimes. And I've never done that here. But uh, many classroom situations have, have fallen victim to questions that didn't do anything but cause strife and did not accomplish anything. I made the observation a number of years ago that I was firmly convinced that I could go into just about any congregation in the brotherhood and within six months I could split that congregation right down the middle. But what would be accomplished in doing that? And of course, some people evidently have that mentality because that's what they try to do when they go into a congregation. They will divide over stuff that don't need to be divided about. They'll end up binding where God hasn't bound and they'll start loosening where God hasn't loosed and thus cause confusion and, and division where the wisdom associated with the teacher that we're talking about here is the one that's going to lead people along to the truth realizing the different levels of intelligence in the membership and applying the principles to the different uh, different standards the different uh, areas in such a way that everyone comes to the same conclusion maybe at different times but at least comes to the same conclusion and we're going to see that a little bit more too in some of these other passages as well and of course there in Romans chapter 2 who is he primarily talking to who is Paul primarily referring to here that's guilty of doing this in the first chapter it's the sins of the Gentiles right second chapter it's the sins that are just as despicable among the Jews and so here are the Jews who said hey buddy you listen to us and we'll tell you everything you need to know well, what, what Paul says, he says, well, you're real good at telling people not to steal, but what if you steal yourself? You need to learn the lesson of not stealing before you start trying to tell somebody else. And that's classified pretty clearly in Matthew chapter 7 as being hypocritical. You know, we're going to preach against something that you're guilty of doing. What? That's, that's hypocritical and it's condemned for sure. And that's the context in Romans chapter 2. All right, anything on number, else on number six? All right, number seven. What light does Romans 12, 4 and 1 Corinthians 12, verse 29 give this important subject here, do you think? All right, everybody doesn't have the same, everybody doesn't have the same abilities. Of course, Romans 12, verse for for as many as how far as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office okay you know your eyes don't do the smelling your and i reckon that's one of the signs now that if you've probably got the virus you know if your tongue don't do the tasting <laughs> you can't taste nothing you can't smell nothing what well, so should we say then in our physical bodies that because my nose doesn't taste then it's not a part of the body or is the nose an important member in our bodies that we need to have a full complement in accomplishing what the body can do well obviously so and of course the comparison that Paul's making is just as the physical body is like that so is the body of Christ everybody's not an eyeball everybody's not a big toe but when all are put together, then we have the full functioning of the body of Christ, just like we have the full functioning of the physical body. And then the question is asked there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Well, of course, the, the questions asked is obviously answered in the negative. No, they're not. So here's all these different functions that people perform. Now, when it comes to the teaching aspect, I submit that we all are held responsible for teaching, but we're not all held responsible for teaching outside of our ability to teach. Some people will never be capable of teaching an adult class. And it's not because of a lack of desire either. You know, there's all types of difficulties that might arise through no fault of their own that would keep them in a position where they could not do it but all of us can teach and all of us have a responsibility to teach obviously parents have a responsibility to teach the children 
Women have the responsibility to teach other women, specifically in Titus chapter 2, older women are to teach younger women. And part of what they're to teach younger women is something that people don't think that you need to be taught. It just happens automatically, but yet Paul said different. If older women are to teach younger women to love their husbands, it seems to me that inspiration regards that as a necessary thing to be taught. Or else it just don't come naturally. What does it really mean to love your husband? What does it really mean to love your kids? What does it really mean to be a homemaker? What does all that mean? Well, older women have that responsibility. And obviously, a, an older woman would have a greater impact on saying those things than would a preacher who happens to be a male. And at different ages, too. How many women won't pay much attention to a 20-year-old preacher but when it comes from an older lady who's been there and done that, then it'll have a greater impact for sure. Now, the truth's the same, obviously, but the person doing the teaching can have a greater impact if it's such as that which is expressed there in Titus chapter 2. All right, question number 8. Consider in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, what is commanded? You've got to teach. The Great Commission cannot be carried out without there being teaching involved. And obviously, we just talked about uh, this passage and the teaching that's necessary to make uh, disciples and to instruct in what's essential to become a child of God. And all of that's involved in a teaching process. Last week, we noted from, uh, of course, John chapter 6, verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I'll raise him up the last day. And I've got friends that have said, see, there it is. The Lord's got to draw you. Well, he does. But how does God draw us to himself? Well, we don't have to speculate. The very next verse tells us. It's an education process. Because a person has to hear, they have to learn, they have to understand. Well, who's going to be doing the teaching so that people might hear and understand? Well, there's a human element that's necessary in that regard not saying that a person can't open the bible themselves and learn the truth because that happens as well but certainly teachers can fulfill a tremendous role in leading people from lost condition to a saved condition absolutely And I dare say that's probably the most important school we go to is the parents teaching children, uh, not just biblical facts, but uh, also how to be a uh, productive citizen and, and contribute to the betterment of society for sure. Uh, does it seem to you, this is just a, one of those questions, you can't miss it because it, it says it seems to you, it may not. But does it seem to you that those that are considered in James chapter 3 at verse 1 are a special class of teachers like preachers and Bible class teachers? Why or why not? So it's a, a, a special level of teachers. More advanced. I think they'd definitely be included in it for sure. I don't know if you could say that because it, the limiting it to that group of people who would be prophets or, I mean, they're not going to mess up on what they're saying because they're inspired to say it, see? So uh, it could definitely have application to every area in which we teach. Don't jump into this position if you can't do it. You know, be careful. And we're going to see why that is the case with the very next question. Elder, for sure. And all a novice, that sounds sort of uh, not a word that we use that often, but it's simply one who's young in whatever they're doing. You know, A, a novice 
uh, golfer um, has a hard time not losing his ball while he's playing 18 holes without, without having the right experiences. That, that's a definite good definition of it. Now, this, this whole discussion then comes to a head here, at least in my estimation, with question number nine. Why would such a one, as we've been talking about here, receive greater condemnation, do you think? How can you say that these individuals that are teaching, how could they receive greater condemnation? I think they have a greater influence, they have a greater responsibility, and it's always been the case that the greater the opportunity, the greater the responsibility, and then at the same time, a greater obligation, which means a greater condemnation if you fall flat on what you're blessed with the ability to do. That's the way it's always been. It's like I've said that the one of the worst possible places to go to torment in all the world would be about where we live right here because of the manifold opportunities that we have available to us where nobody can honestly say, well, I never heard anything like that. Well, if you didn't, you didn't want to hear it because you could have heard it if you wanted to hear it. If you had a desire for the truth, then you're going to find the truth. So as far as blessings go, then those who are blessed the greater are held more highly accountable for what they're blessed with. Same, way, same thing with a teacher. If a teacher, and of course, maybe that's what, you know, I've said uh, a person, the Lord doesn't expect anybody to do anything they can't do with his help. And whatever the Lord expects us to do, we can do. Now, if that is the case, and then he wants us to be teachers in some capacity, then rest assured we can, or else he wouldn't hold us responsible for being teachers. There's a difference between a, a person feeling comfortable. There's not a whole lot of things. I remember the last time Jim Boyd held a meeting here, he said, uh, he said every time before he goes into the pulpit, even he'd been preaching for 123 years, I think then, he said every time he went in the pulpit, he had butterflies in his stomach. Well, I do too. It's like right before you run out on the football field, you want somebody to walk up and hit you in the stomach and knock the butterflies out so you can go out there and knock heads, you know. Well, that's, it's, it's similar to that. Don't want nobody be hitting me in the stomach, though, please. But, uh, but there's that realizing the responsibility that's on your shoulders and the obligation is an overwhelming one, a great responsibility. And obviously, if people don't look upon preaching and teaching in that way, then you'd sort of question what their motivation actually is. And we're going to see that in a few questions here in just a minute too. So I would answer that. The greater condemnation goes along with the greater responsibility or the greater opportunity. Yes, sir. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. And one of the most difficult uh, quarters in my education was taking advanced preaching and philosophy of language at the same time. It was miserable because in the philosophy of language, the idea, which is common, pretty well common sense, is you use terms so that people don't misunderstand what you're saying. Well, I got to wear, you know, a, a little old short sermon. I was having to talk and think so slow that it was taking forever to get it out because everything I'd say, I said, wait a minute, I reckon somebody could mis mistake that. Or, uh, and of course, they're going to. 
I mean, it don't matter how clear it is. Like, the example I used, now I showed y'all this not too long ago. I was preaching to the congregation, and I made the observation. This was not out here in the open by itself either. I said, there's people in this congregation that haven't crossed paths or talked to each other in months, maybe even years. Now, there was a context that I said that from, see? So I didn't no sooner get home than I started getting phone calls. He says, who is so mad at each other that they're refusing to talk to each other? I said, that's not what I said. That's not what I said at all. And so it just kept on and on and on. I said, well, I'm going to have to address it. So the next service, I went in the pulpit and I said, how many people in this audience heard me say that we got brethren here that so despise each other they won't even say anything to each other? Over 50% of the people raised their hand. Even Tammy did. <laughs> I said, that's not what I said. What I said was we got people that come in at the last minute and we got people that leave at the amen, and their paths never cross. We got 10 different doors we go out and come in. And so it was not uncommon in a congregation of 100 for somebody to be making announcements, and they'd say, well, who is this that died? Well, they'd been coming there for two years, and they didn't know who they was. And I said, get out of your little family gatherings. I mean, you see each other and talk to each other all the time. Get out of your little family gatherings and get around the congregation and see who else is here. That's what I said. Well, then the fellow who happens to be now the, the high sheriff of Smith County, he said, you need to be a, a logger. I said, what? why? I said, there's a difference. Now, so I submit that somebody was feeling guilty, and that's why they got some mad. You know, because they realized they didn't go anywhere else except in their little bitty pod every service. That's the only people they knew that was there. And so they heard me say something I didn't say. So you have to, you have to be careful. And even on your best days and thinking that every word you've used is so obvious, it's not necessarily obvious to the hearer for sure. People can mishear you and uh, so that, that just goes along with the goes along with the work for sure and I mean that happens in classrooms all across the land too so it's not like uh, it's exclusively a problem with preaching the gospel because it happens in other places too um, so this next question actually goes right along with what we're talking about are teachers under closer scrutiny only by God now we've established that since they're under greater condemnation then they are under closer scrutiny by God because they're in a position of teaching. But is it only God? Of course, Daniel's done answer that. <laughs> but of course it's not, you know. If we don't expect the teacher to know what he's talking about, then what are we doing? You know, we expect, if somebody's going to stand up and start telling us something about what the book of James says, then we sort of expect them to know a little bit about what the book of James says. No way. Well, rightfully so. If they say, well, you know, I, I ain't never, uh, I never read this before. Well, that's amazing. Hmm. It's new to me, too. Well, what are you doing standing up there teaching the book of James for? See? I never uh, heard the situation happen just here the other day where there was a, a big meeting and uh, orders from uh, headquarters had made their way down to uh, Dunlop and, and uh, they had this meeting and the people in charge had to admit they never had read the orders from headquarters yet. And here we're trying to make decisions and the people who were supposed to be leading the charge didn't, were clueless as to what was going on. Now that's not good leadership. That's not good uh, anything. If you don't know what's going on then uh, you might need to let somebody else somebody else do it. all right anything else on that particular question now here we get some practical questions more practical maybe number 11 since the judgment is greater for those who misuse the position of teacher what about the reward for those who faithfully do the work of the teacher is there a greater reward for those who faithfully do the work of a teacher? 
Are there any passages of Scripture that might lend themselves to that idea? I think so. Turn, if you have your Bibles handy, and hopefully you do, to the third chapter of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And whoever gets there first, uh, you can read the 11th through the 15th verse, if you don't mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So in, in this context, the, the, the wording may be somewhat obscure and, and written in such a way that it's hard to grasp, but the main point to get from these few verses is here's the work of a teacher. What is the work of a teacher? Those that are converted, yeah, souls. Here is the positive result of the teacher and it's converted souls. Now, is there a responsibility well there obviously is a responsibility to a certain degree to seek to ensure that those that are converted remain converted but if they don't stay faithful is that a mark against the teacher well no will they suffer will the teacher suffer the loss of his soul because those that he's taught don't remain faithful no what if they do remain faithful Aha, that's great reward there. Knowing that you've been instrumental in teaching somebody the truth and they stay faithful and maybe you're even able to preach their funeral, you know. There ain't no better reward than that. And believe it or not, there are people that will use, use this, have used this passage of scripture to try to say that if a person is a false teacher, then because he thinks he's teaching the truth, he's going to be all right. Even though people that listen to what he says, they never obey the truth anyhow, they're going to be lost. But the person that's sincere in teaching what he thinks true, then he's going to be saved anyhow. Now, where would that concept come from? From the fertile imagination of men's mind? It wouldn't come from the scripture, obviously. No. Well, intention doesn't allow the teaching of that which is false. No matter how well-intentioned you are, if you're teaching that which is contrary to the truth, it's contrary to the truth, and all the all the wishing and the hope sowing and uh, emotional dedication you might supply to it doesn't change that which is false to that which is true. There's a difference. That certainly we need to be sincere, but we also need to be right. And when you put sincerity and correctness together, then you got something. But when you put sincerity and something else together you don't have nothing but sincerity paul sincerely thought he ought to do any many things contrary to the name of jesus of nazareth and he did he thought he ought to wipe out christianity well was he sincere sure he was was he doing the right thing absolutely not and so here the work of the teacher will bring abundant joy reward in realization that those that have been taught uh, they will indeed be saved. They will when they are saved. But the but the point being relative to the loss that suffered is the loss in the realization that here's people who did not remain faithful, and thus the reward is not enjoyed by them, and that's sad for a teacher. You know, certainly so. Yes, sir. Exactly. Exactly. 
Sure, sure. And and I mean, you can't get a better commentary on those verses in First Timothy or First Corinthians chapter three than than what Jim has provided there for us. The joy of realization that someone you've taught remains faithful. I mean, that's the the very zenith of the, of the reason why we exist. Is someone, yes, sir. Exactly. exactly. Context has a remarkable way of clearing up false doctrine. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes, ma'am. Second Thessalonians one. First Thessalonians one. I'm sorry. Two. I'm sorry. Two nineteen and twenty. Well, he's talking about the fact that here's the work of the teacher, which is the convert. If that convert is lost, then that's a loss in the realization that someone you've been instrumental in teaching is lost, but it doesn't affect your eternal destiny for sure. Yeah. Fire is oftentimes an illustration of difficulty, of, of testing and you know the idea of being put under uh, a trial or a testing that allows the refuse to boil off and, and you're left with the purity of the sort of like the, the image of purifying metals you know and getting rid of the and of course that the idea putting that all together is that the longer you live striving to walk, follow, uh, follow in the footsteps of Jesus, the more Christ-like you become, the more godly in your pursuits, and then you are becoming more purified, eradicating from your life the things that would uh, lead you to be lost. So it's, it's a design result, and it works. I mean, how many, how many observations can we make of those who fit that very narrative? You know, we don't have any... Uh, when a person gets to a, a long life and here you see the process that's taking place throughout their lives where uh, they're, perf they're examples of what we need to all strive to be for sure. All right, number 12. What are some wrong motivations in wanting to be a teacher? Pr somebody say praise a man? Praise. And I thought of one. Somebody might volunteer to teach so they wouldn't have to be in this class. That'd be a wrong reason. <laughs> Two, so maybe that's why some of the people agreed to, to teach tonight is so they wouldn't. Have to be. But uh, but that obviously is a a, a wrong motivation. Uh, some people want a, a platform to demonstrate how smart they are and how many how many big words they can use and impress people. Uh, but it's always been the case, my observation, of people who were really highly educated teachers of the truth, they would make things that were difficult easily understood. I mean, it's always, I, because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to communicate God's will. The, uh, who was it? It seemed like I'm, I'm not sure who it was that Daddy quoted from, it may have been, uh, it may have been Brother Hardiman, that if you make the message in such a fashion that the calves can eat it then the rest of the cows will make it just fine or something like that you know and uh, but if you elevate it up there where only the the seasoned cow can get it then the poor old calves are going to starve to death so if you take something that's that's uh, a little bit more difficult to to understand a little bit more difficult to explain and you get it down there where the very lowly and least affluent uh, can get it, then that's, that's, that's what true wisdom would dictate and true intelligence, in my estimation, not using 25 cent words to try to impress somebody. 
Anything else? Now, I use the, uh, somebody say, well, I've told this before as to when I first uh, decided to preach, okay? Was over, was going over the hall, and uh, Garnet Randolph had a heart attack, and so we had a business meeting, and uh, Hugh, of course, Hugh Lamb was was not going to be able to fill in. He was preaching somewhere else all the time anyhow. And so Hugh said, somebody's going to have to fill in here until Garnet gets back. And I'm being perfectly honest here. I looked around at all those guys in there, and I said, well, I know I can do as good as them. So I volunteered to preach. You know. And, uh, of course, some people said I should have stayed in the barber shop in Chattanooga, but but uh, but that was that's the truth and it wasn't a matter of me saying i'm better than anybody but i did know that i knew quite a few things about preaching being a preacher's kid and all and i knew a little bit about the problems that went along with that and it all itself and i still decided to do it in spite of all those things so uh if it's if somebody's doing it to show how much they know or to impress somebody then that's obviously the wrong motivation for doing it but you know you have an example even even in the new testament where there were people who thought that through their preaching they could increase the problems for the apostle paul and paul went so far as to say well as long as the gospels preach i can take anything they throw my way you know that's sort of a paraphrase but he was thankful that the gospel was preached nonetheless all right number 13 what are some right motivations you want to be a teacher That's it. If your desire is to lead a person to understand the truth, believe the truth, and obey the truth, it doesn't get any better as a motivation than that right there. That's what your motivation has to be, is to help people see. And all that's involved in just those few little words there, the necessity of patience, the necessity of uh, (laughs) long-suffering, I mean, the necessity of patience again and along I mean it's those are qualities that are absolutely essential because uh, as anything worthwhile it takes time sometimes and at times you'll feel like uh, running over the wall and beating your head on the wall uh, but uh, that's not going to accomplish anything either With that that being the right desire are there any other desire what about to fill in for a preacher until he gets back from a heart attack is that a pretty good reason i think so thank you that's it that you you've got to have the desire for sure <clears throat> exactly I'm, Exactly. Like Paul's indebtedness that he felt to every man. He, he couldn't be satisfied knowing what he knew without imparting that same knowledge to others. I completely forgot about stopping early. <laughs> oh, me. Uh, but we are going to stop early, and Mark's going to talk to us here. We're going to have, a, uh, when the kids get in here, we're going to uh, have an invitation song, and then, uh, and then Mark's going to talk about the work. So let's just wait on them to get in here. Thank y'all so much.